Good afternoon, all of you. And uh, it's indeed a wonderful experience to see all of you here, or let's say all of us here who have been locked down and who have been unlocked. And in spite of being unlocked, we don't know whether we are still in the unlocked state or in the locked state. So the unlock lock game is going and uh, we have still not figured out what is it to be in a lockdown stage and uh, what is it to be in an unlocked state. So thank you all of you for registering for this course. And if possible, you can keep your videos. And I know that if you have bandwidth issues, I do understand, but otherwise let us have a face-to-face communication because we also know that uh, you know we all attend seminars and webinars we want to attend as many webinars so uh, by uh, muting and uh, locking our videos we can do multiple things and we can be very creative but then may I request your creativity to be slightly reduced for one hour so that you will not do other things while you are in this webinar uh, though that it's a great possibility and it's actually a great opportunity for us to be multi-talented. But uh, this course, I think, demands our full attention because we are in a, a, a co-learning uh, space. So once again, thank you, all of you. And um, uh, I, I know that this audience is a mixed lot of audience, younger people, engineers, scholars, artists, students, former ambassadors, teachers. So it's absolutely wonderful. And I thank Professor Ambassador, Dr. Ambassador Saurabh Kumar to be there. That's a special uh, welcome to him. And uh, of course, a special welcome to all of you, all teachers there, out there, students, scholars, because we all have shared experience. Isn't it rare that we become part of one single experience all over the globe at almost the same time, isn't it? Rarely we would talk about such experiences where we can be together and can be partakers, beholders of one single experience. It, it doesn't occur that often historically. Now, I also want to listen from you about your experiences. But then uh, since the microphone is with me at this point, uh, I wish to share a few ideas. And then I'm very keen to listen to as many as uh, possible and as many as of you are ready to share. Uh, so let, let me just uh, start on with this topic, which is the very first topic of this nine lectures on the nine dimensions of the lockdown experience. Now you might say, are there only nine? Don't you think there's a 10? Yes, there's possibility of a 10th dimension also or 11th dimension, but we have taken uh, nine dimensions, which we think are very important. And most of you would have gone through these nine dimensions or perhaps are having the potential of perhaps going through these dimensions, or some of us may not go through it also. Uh, it depends upon our personalities, our way of looking at issues, worldviews, et cetera. But then in general, we can say these nine dimensions are kind of universal when we analyze a cosmic global experience like the lockdown experience. Now, when we talk about the lockdown experience, there are two assumptions which I uh, wish to be clear about and present to you for your kind attention. And these two assumptions have to be taken as reality, which means we don't question those two assumptions. Because if we question those two assumptions, we will not be able to progress further. So let me share with you what those two assumptions are. These two assumptions are very simple innocent looking, sounding realities of our life. And these are number one, the self, and number two, 
experience. Now, why do we say that these two assumptions, namely self and experience, are to be taken as realities, two realities without questioning? Give a thought to it. Do we have any experience without a self? Can you think about any experience without a self? Well, as you struggle to find one, you would also know that even if you are saying that, okay, well, at that point of experience, I really didn't have that experience, uh, the self with me. But then even if you are trying to memorize a past event or you are trying to narrate uh, an experience when perhaps you were unconscious or you were in a different state of mind, you are still narrating the story which belongs to a person, an individual who has a self. So the self has been collating, collecting, connecting, and curating our experiences. So without self, there cannot be any experience. So this is one reality which we have to take for granted, at least for this one hour or for this course, because uh, that is something which is inevitable for us to understand the whole intricacy of the subject which we have at hand. And the number two assumption is that there is no experience without a self. The first is there is no self without an experience. And the second is there is no experience without a self. Now there is no self which is bereft of an experience. This is also important. You might say that, uh, and at least I think uh, uh, some of us would like to talk about it at least from an argument sake, oh, well, I have a teen number of experiences, but I really don't think I have, an, I have a self because I really have not found myself. I'm still in the mode of discovery of myself. I really don't think I have a self, but I have a multitude of experiences which are bitter, sweet, et cetera, et cetera, but I really don't think I have a self. Well, this is something again, uh, which has to be questioned and reflected upon whether we talk about Western philosophy or Indian philosophy, even to talk about a philosophical system, if that gives an evidence, we know that the very act of thinking needs an I. And that is the whole Cartesian uh, paradigm of I think, therefore I am. You know, in order to be, you need to have an experience. And in order to have an experience, you need to be. These two, the self and the experience, are intricately interconnected and they are almost unavoidable for each other, even if sometimes they don't like each other at times. At times we wish, oh my God, if only I was another self. At times we wish, oh my God, I only had, if I had a different experience. So the self covets for different experiences and uh, the experiences sometimes tell us if only we were a different person, right? So at some point we feel that some of the experiences are not palatable to us. And at some point we feel that we have great experiences, but only if there was a better person or a different person in us, we, were, we will be able to appreciate these uh, multitudinal variety of experiences that overwhelms us. So these two assumptions, I think we have to take them for granted, which is there is no experience without a self. And number two, there is no self which is bereft of an experience. Now, what is a self and what is experience? We are not doing analytic philosophy, but I think sometimes analysis helps us to take things in their entirety and in its clarity. So we are not trying to analyze these and make them disappear with a magic wand of analysis. No, we are trying to make them integrate with each other, include each other with the help of simple analysis, simple exposition, simple exploration. What is the self? The self is an entity which you can call as I to begin with. You realize that there is an I or you are an I I am an I because of this powerful mechanism in us called as the self. The origin of the self, people variously related to neurochemical mechanisms, 
electrochemical mechanisms, spiritual reasons, psychological reasons, sociological reasons, linguistic reasons. So uh, a neural linguist would say that, okay, well, the construction of I goes to the different elements of language and uh, neurochemical mechanisms which we have. A spiritual person might say that, oh, well, the self comes because of a transcendental space which you travel with. A psychological, a psychologist or a person interested in psychology would say that, well, these are all thoughts and uh, attitudes which is going on and yourself is a combination of these attitudes and uh, mental states. A philosopher doesn't say much about what is the self, but, but there has been a lot of discussion in the East and the West. And this discussion has been not through just analysis of language, but it has been through exploration and experience of oneself. And that's why you would see Socrates, Aristotle, and many other Greek philosophers walking their path walking miles and miles, meeting people in the streets and talking to them. And through that talking, discovering their own selves and also engaging with other selves. We also have in India, several saints and philosophers and masters of traditions who have been walking. Walking has been a very important part of most of the lives of lives of most of the philosophers. Many people walked and walked. And why do you walk? You walk because you meet people. You meet people, then you have engagement with their self, which allows you to discover your own self. So there is a self-discovery at any point of time. So when we say, what is self? Our immediate thinking is what? Well, when I ask you, where is water? You will tell me, well, the water is here in this bottle or a glass in front of you or your kitchen or wherever you are sitting. But, and where is your pen? You might say it is in my, uh, in, it's on my fingers or I kept it on a pen holder or at this point, I don't have a pen. Can we talk about self like that? At this point, I don't have a self. I, at this point, I've kept myself in my, particular place, my sacred secret and sacred place, can we say that? Extremely difficult because any act of language, any act of appreciating oneself or the other begins with at least a minimalist notion of the self, even a minimalist notion of self, because without that, you just cannot do anything. So, so self is one idea we cannot place misplace or displace. But we talk about placing, displacing, and misplacing the self in psychiatry and psychology. But all this self which is misplaced or displaced is a self which has been placed at some point of time. And that self which is placed there continues to be there. But it's just that our relation with such a very nicely placed self sometimes go haywire. We forget or we tend to lose seeing where our self is. So what I mean to say is the self is not an idea. All ideas come because we are a self. And this is uh, some, something which is very linguistically difficult. Language is very difficult because you are talking about yourself to yourself using words which can come only because you have a self. So which comes first? Word come first or the self comes first? As I'm thinking, as I'm speaking, I'm thinking, what is coming first? Is it myself which is coming first and talking to you? Or is it the ideas that are coming in my mind which is promoting a self? Well, I would think this is a million dollar question and we will not be able to solve it very soon. And if we solve it, then I would think there is no more imagination of the highest degree because the experience of self is the most imaginative experience. So let us stop there on discussing the idea of self, that self is not an idea, but it is the most nourishing, most 
empowering entity in all of us. Now, what is experience? And so this is, these are two questions I want to delve with a little bit before going further. What is experience? Now, I don't think anyone of us, or any one of us will have any difficulty explaining this, right? What is experience? Take a moment. In fact, we all can say that, oh, of course I have had umpteen number of experiences, right? When, when the moment our memory starts as a teenager or, or, or a tiny baby or a toddler, we have immense number of experiences. So there's no doubt that we have experiences, right? It's intubitable. You cannot say, oh, in fact, I don't think I have had any experiences. Well, we are not talking about cataclysmic um, lightning experiences of a particular kind of substance induced or person induced. No, we are talking about the very fact of experience, the very overwhelming nature of experience, which can be sensory, which can be psychological, which can be cognitive, and which can be all this together. In academics or in disciplines, which require a particular training in order to understand them, there is a habit of dissecting and uh, placing them in different boxes so as to understand uh, what is experience. But then we all know that when we say, I have an experience to, I have an experience, what we mean is the experience comes as a whole. Samhita, may I request you to reserve your questions and ask them later, because let's go a little further and then we will have the questions, okay? So just note down in your notebook so that others also won't get disturbed, all right? Thank you very much, Samhita. So, um, yes, uh, so experience is something which comes as a whole. They are not placed as parts in compartments. They are not parts sitting in compartments, but it's a whole. Every experience is overwhelming. Every experience takes you as a whole. Every experience excites you as a whole. Every, ex every experience can challenge you as a whole. That is why when an experience comes, you don't usually say, oh, I had, in this experience, I had a memory. Or in another experience, you wouldn't say, oh, in that experience, I had love. And you might say, oh, in this experience, I have a, I learned something. No, you don't distinguish between the parts of experiences such as memory, emotions, feelings as distinct and uh, independently situated parts. No, these come as a whole because all of this together give rise to experience as a whole, as a very overwhelming phenomenon in our life. So every experience is overwhelming. It's just not that we don't, we don't show the overwhelmingness of each experience in our day-to-day -day life because we just don't have the time and our culture has trained us not to be overwhelmed by every single experience. But if you take a moment and just sit for 10 minutes quietly and uh, make the determination Okay, let me go through these 10 minutes and let me see what experiences I have. You can see that every, every perhaps minute of that experience, you would have also the reflection that each part of that experience, of moment of that experience is overwhelming. Because the quality of experience is to overwhelm us. But our culture, our training, our pedagogic methods, and as a civilization, of this species, we have been trained to undermine the moment-to-moment -moment overwhelming nature of experience. <clears throat> so as very civilized people, as very cultured people, educated people, trained people, uh, very fine, refined people, we tend to only talk about experience in terms of narratives, in terms of stories, in terms of sharings. We, in that process, we also forget how to receive or how to be sensitive to an experience every moment. This has, of course, have given us some advantages, 
this has also given us some disadvantages. And we will see some of this as we go on. Now, I, we don't have too much time, so let me just carry on from there. So the next idea which I want to share is, of course, the hero or the heroine of this drama which is going on, which is called as the lockdown experience. And please pay attention. The lock here is L-O-C-K and D-O-W-N, lockdown experience, right? Now, what is or was is lockdown experience? I'm sorry, lockdown phenomenon. Because people are still going through the lockdown phenomenon. That's why we cannot say something it as it was was. As currently we look at the global trend, uh, perhaps a billion people are going through the lockdown phenomenon. So what it is or what was it? And what was the process? It is not only a definition. There seems to have been a process. There has been a beginning, there was a middle point, and perhaps towards an end point. We don't know. Now, let me have your attention on this. Most of us think the lockdown experience has been of one kind. And what was this kind? The lockdown experience was a response from the state from the nation, from the country where we live, from the governments who rule us, with varieties of control and surveillance. In, in very brief words, that's what perhaps we will understand as lockdown phenomenon. The state enforcing varieties of controls through its stakeholders, through its agents, in order to curtail our moment and the state used various machinery towards this and also various kinds of surveillance in order to achieve this particular control. So this is in general, the lockdown phenomenon as we understand globally in the context of COVID-19. Now there is another version of lockdown and that's why I wanted you to be careful about the spelling. The first lockdown is L-O-C-K, lockdown. This number two is L-O-C-K-E-D, locked down. I feel there is a difference between these two and we haven't started actually distinguish between these two. And this course is all about distinguishing between the lockdown and being locked down. So that ED needs to be having a little emphasis there. Now, what is being locked down? Locked down is primarily, uh, it's a psychological phenomenon. It's a, a, a mental experience of what kind? A mental experience of restriction to begin with. Restriction in, for what? Restriction primarily in two things. One is your space, Number two, movement. These are the two which are restricted in a very high order as part of the state-induced, state-enforced surveillance mechan mechanisms of lockdown. In the locked down, number two, which is L-O-C-K-E-D, we feel, we experience tremendous amount of restriction which is enforced upon us over which we don't have a choice. We become choiceless followers of a state-induced surveillance mechanism. And uh, as a result, we experience restricted space, restricted movement, and uh, limited movement, perhaps not restricted, but limited movement, and uh, limited food or social contact. But in this context, I remember one more thing, and I think I should not forget that, saying that when I'm emphasis, emphasizing on the restricted and limited movement. There were several migrant laborers who were moving all the time. So is it correct to say that the lockdown was about limited movement? We saw them moving all the while, right? Miles and miles and miles moving every day. So what, what happened in their case? Where, wherein they moving? Well, they were moving 
so that they can stop their movement. Well, this is a very highly philosophically loaded sentence, which I just said, but I don't want to go through it, uh, the anal analysis of it, but I just wanted to say that finally, the idea was to have restricted movement or to settle. So even when you saw the migrant laborers, the homeless people moving, they were moving towards a space where movement naturally stops, or they had the occasion or the leisure where they don't have to move. They continuously moved so that they can stop moving. So this also, I think we have to keep in mind because of this, very glaring experience and the perception and the visuals which we have seen, particularly in the beginning time of the lockdown of the laborers and people continuously moving, a girl cycling to her home, uh, a mother cycling to bring her child back. So different kinds of people and different kinds of movement. But all this movement was to move towards a restrictive space which you can almost say, which is movement-less. Now, when we talk about the lockdown, there are also a very interesting idea. Uh, it will, it's, I think it's good to call it as an idea because I don't know how it works. And this idea is of unlock. I think it was on June 2nd or so, we heard that word first, right? Again, a very state-induced word of unlocking. So the government, the state told you, okay, from tomorrow onwards, you're unlocking. So just get unlocked. Isn't it interesting that uh, both the locking and the unlocking was not so easy for us. For the state, locking was very easy because of its machinery, because of its forces of surveillance and control, like any state should be, as a nation should be. Unlocking also seems to be relatively easy because it was primarily, it was communicated to us through newspapers or news channels that tomorrow you're going to unlock. And this unlock was partially lifting restrictions of your movement. You can talk, you can go to perhaps now, not to the movie halls, but you can go to your roads, start walking, or I don't know, what and all are open because maybe the malls are open. So you can start moving and you can start unlock. For the state machinery, locking and unlocking was part of their surveillance and control. But as a psychological phenomenon of being locked down, L-O-C-K-E-D, locked down, to get unlocked, U-N-L-O-C-K-E-D, is a tremendous responsibility. And that is why you are sitting here and I'm sitting here to discuss it, how to unlock. Apparently, it looks like unlocking is very simple, right? You just get out of your house, you, uh, you know, just go to the park, take a mile of walk. Are you being unlocked? Well, you don't know about it. What is the time needed for unlocking? What we have gone through as locked down, L-O-C-K-E-D, time alone will tell us. Our own life will tell us. But the point here is unlocking is not just like a, uh, like a, just a fingers uh, lift like that. It takes time. It takes our own reflections of different kind. Now, let me come back to the locked down experience one more time and quickly go through uh, what was lockdown? What was the lockdown? Please remember, I'm not talking anymore about L-O-C-K-D-O-W-N, but I'm talking about L-O-C-K-E-D and D-O-W-N, so locked down. The difference, I would think, between lockdown and lockdown, one is a state machinery, the other is a psychological phenomenon. The very overwhelming experience when we, start, when we started our lockdown in our own homes or in our own, I don't know, in our own places where, where we are staying, perhaps everybody has their own place, uh, which could be a home or which could be elsewhere, somewhere in their hostels for students, they were in the hostels or Fiji's or wherever. 
So when we started, what was that very cataclysmic uh, phenomenon which came, came about through the lockdown? I really wish to ask you for that, but then perhaps we'll come to the discussion later. But for the time being, let me say what that is, at least what I think uh, was the most poignant and most overwhelming part of the lockdown was a chronic uncertainty. A chronic uncertainty was thrusted upon us or a chronic uncertainty emerged out of us. When you say thrusted upon us, you're almost like saying someone else thrusted upon us. Then you go back to a machinery which is state controlled. But when you say it is emerged out of us, you can also take responsibility and you also being an agent, having gone through such an experience. <coughs> what was the chronic uncertainty about? The chronic uncertainty was about home, for the homeless people, it was about home. And uh, for even the home full people, it was about home because how do you take care of the home at that point? The chronic uncertainty about food, about job security, about financial security, and of course, not to talk about the least, a chronic uncertainty about health. How do we know we are healthy? How do we know that we will stay healthy for the coming days? So the uncertainty was so impactful that it started from something which is very earthly and maintained, such as toilet paper, and entered in something called lasting health. So we saw a lot of uh, uncontrollable behaviors for hoarding and uh, complaining about lack of things, hoarding, buying, and stacking things. And uh, stacking, stocking things, was uh, not because we didn't have them, because we thought the future is uncertain, so I may have to hoard it for the future. And now how long is that future? When is that future going to end? And that was the biggest uncertainty. We didn't know when will be the locked down will end. So it's an uncertainty which is structured by uncertainties. The content is, uncertain, content is formed of uncertainty. The structures are of uncertainty. And uh, so this was the, the, I would think, the most unsettling part of our experience when we started the unlock, I'm sorry, the lockdown phenomenon. And now, as we started our life, I think more toilet paper became available, more essentials became available. The state machinery said, not to worry, we will reach you these things, or, uh, or there was always a promise coming from the states that things will be okay. Whether it was for, it, whether it was for people like us who, are, who sit in beautiful homes and enjoy the comforts or for people who were in the roads and wearing the sunlight of summer. For both, the state continuously gave the, uh, the assurance that things will be okay, there will not be a scarcity. Whatever the reason, we, I think out of choice, or out of choicelessness, we accepted that, we believed that to some extent, and we started carrying our life as the lockdown started. I'm trying to take a flashback, you know, what was the lockdown? So it started with tremendous uncertainty, which was of a chronic nature, which stared, uh, stared us, stared at our face bluntly to begin with, and then, there were different kinds of thinking coming to us. People who are staying in homes. I'm not talking about people who are walking in the street because I feel their story is different. And I'm incapable of narrating their story in this one hour. And I don't think I'm even knowledgeable to narrate their stories. So pardon me, this would be about people who are, who are present here in the screen and maybe who people similar to us who are, who were, settled in a sense in an unsettled manner in their own homes or their own places. So as we started our locked down experiences, life, there are a few other things came to us. And what was this? One was boredom. 
and the other was annoyance, which exhibited in irritation. Being irritated, being irritated at small things, being irritated with the people around us, being irritated with, pe with people who are not around us, and uh, uh, a plateaued feeling of having nothing to do in life, as if life is so blank and so endless that you didn't know what to do. So boredom is either having too much of one thing or it is having something at all, not having something at all. So when you have something too much, then you feel you need to move away. When you don't have something also, you feel that you need to move away. So boredom is also uh, has a great impact in our life. Of course, we don't talk about in psychology boredom as a, a you know, very serious case of, nobody will say that, oh, he's suffering from serious case of boredom. No, we usually say, okay, he's suffering from serious case of depression and so on. But we have not thought about it. Boredom is a very powerful psychological phenomenon. And it is also a very powerful philosophical idea, which I will perhaps talk about later, not in this lecture. So because of boredom and annoyance, we also started relating in our own manners. And I'm a person who is always fascinated by the power of social media and digital technologies, particularly in the context of COVID-19. It was fascinating to see many of us at that point having an unusual desire to connect. And these days when we connect, we don't take up our phone and talk. No, we post in the timeline of our Facebook. So that is our new way of connecting, at least in the contemporary times. When we have to connect, we have to post about our connecting. And so this was amazing that you saw a lot of social media activity at that time. And what, we were, what were we saying? We were saying, oh, I am alive. Do look at me. This was what we were saying. Of course, we didn't say in verbally because of our dignity, we wouldn't say that. But without saying this, this, is, this was what we were saying. And how did we say that? We started cooking things with different colors. We started painting, you know, I don't know, marks, perhaps papers, a lot of kinds of things. We started wearing saris and just taking pictures. Of course, I'm talking about women. Men also, I don't know what, did they wore something new? I don't remember, but at least I do remember. Women started wearing clothes, new clothes, and taking pictures and posting. And people who were not very sure of or courageous to wear new dress and do a selfie on time picture. They posted a picture five years back and said, this is a throwback. This was, a, this was a, how I was five years back. And all this was to say, I am alive, do look at me. So there was this incessant desire to connect to a world which was lost to you in a sense of being locked down. You knew, you know you have a world outside your home, perhaps the few walls of your home. But then the challenge was that you were not sure whether the world was with you. So it was very important for us to say, yes, I am alive, please look at me too. So as a very civilized people, we did our own ways of uh, bringing that very unusual desire into action. Because usually that desire to say, I'm alive and look at me is very subtle. We do that all the time, but it's very subtle. During the lockdown, the, this desire was seen in a very unusual degree and the desire was to connect and connect to the outer world and because of which and by which connect to oneself and to affirm to oneself that I am alive. And this was very, very important from the mental health point of view. Now, there was another phase of the lockdown, which I want to come to, uh, which is, I would like to say, as a polarization of space. 
the space was polarized. How was the space polarized? Very simply, we can say the space was polarized to begin with, safe and unsafe. We started dividing between what is safe and what is unsafe. How to make the unsafe safe? How can the vegetables which come and get delivered on our doorstep, which are at that point unsafe, be sanitized and be made safe? How can the people, if at all people came, perhaps, I don't know, as milk venters, because I think they were able, they were allowed to come at least, in, at least to a particular point, and they were able to deliver milk packets. So there was this very immediate polarization of space, such as safe and unsafe space. And uh, the second was what is healthy or what is health and what is disease. In usual life, these binaries, we don't think about it, talk about it on a day-to-day -day manner, though we live with it. But then that has a very cumulative or as a long-term experience in us. But at this point of one or two months, what we have gone through, this polarization of space was very, very stark of what is health and what is disease. And the third, what is clean and what is contaminated. A very strong sense of polarization between what is clean and what is contaminated. And let me, or let us, Remember at this point, we are not talking about just material objects, cleanliness and contamination. If we are able to close our eyes for five minutes or 10 minutes and look back, we will know or we will be able to honest, be honest to ourselves and think. We not only thought which objects are clean and contaminated, we also thought which one of us is clean and contaminated. So it, not, it was not just a physical object related cleanliness contamination. It started overpowering our notions of people, our own family, our own friends. So that was the power of polarization. All this happened in the larger binary, which is very much needed for our cognitive functioning. And that binary is me and the other. In other lectures and other classes, we have discussed about it, the me and the other. But in usual circumstances, this distinction or the binary of me and other is something which is cognitively desired, desirable, and needed for us to take care of our day-to-day -day life activities. And it remains in a very subtle dimension. It doesn't become gross. But during the lockdown, the most subtle capabilities, one of the most subtle capabilities all of us have, which is to distinguish between me and the other, no more was subtle. It became the grossest. It became the most outer exteriorized binary. So it was very clear what all things could be called as belonging to us or what is that which is addressed as me and what belongs to the other. I don't think there has been ever an occasion where you see this much exteriorization for a very subtle inner capability such as me and the other. Now, I think all these different uh, parts of the lockdown experience were further heightened because of one other thing. We are all news hungry, right? All of us are news hungry. Of course, some people read newspapers, some people read uh, something else for news. Different people have different sources, preferred sources for information. But we are all are news hungry. So what was happening? The pandemic was also giving rise to what is called as an infodemic. Lots and lots of information through social media, WhatsApp, news channels, telephone, people. And what are these news? Every bit of news was a breaking news. What is a breaking news? When do you hear a breaking news? When the election comes, when the counting happens, you say there is a breaking news, this guy is getting more votes. <clears throat> when there is an earthquake, suddenly we hear there is a breaking news, there is an earthquake. 
But these two happens not on a day-to-day -day basis, right? It happens once in a while. But what was happening through, uh, during the lockdown? Not only every day, perhaps every 10 minutes, we were having breaking news. So the breaking news were powerful enough to shatter an otherwise steady, stabilized mind, which we all have. And uh, because of which, our regular routines and habits were disturbed. We were wanting to sit in front of the television or in front of our sources of social media and other sources to get the news. Because every, every 10 minutes there was a breaking news and we didn't want to miss that breaking news. So this was something which was again very powerful that was happening. And further, this resulted in distrust and hopelessness. Distrust on the possibility of being healthy again. Distrust on the possibility of meeting a healthy person again. Because the paranoia, that the power of paranoia was developing so fast that it was very difficult to believe, first of all, whether we are healthy. So there's a paranoia which is self-directed first, that whether I am healthy, maybe I am holding these viruses in various forms, various, <coughs> various mutated forms of it. And second, the paranoia of our immediate ones, whether they are healthy. So the, the amount of distrust was very powerful. And it further gave rise to what is called as a hopelessness of a bleak future. A future which is bleak, which is of course started with an uncertainty as we discussed in the beginning, the chronic uncertainty and hopelessness. How do we hope? What do we hope about? Now, this part, I would like to end here because it was the bleak part I explained to you. The I have the most challenging part I explained to you. But I think it's very important. We talk about it aloud. We talk about it in a verbal manner so that we are aware that these overwhelming components of the lockdown experience were actually happening to all of us. Now, the second part is coping and coping the distress which we all experienced. Coping the uncertainty coping the distrust, coping the hopelessness. How do we cope with it? How did we cope with it? Of course, by saying that, I am already saying that we did cope with it, we are coping with it. So I do not want to even think for a moment that our abilities and capabilities to cope with an uncertain future, of an uncertain future, of a bleak future, are minimal, no. I think as a community, as a nation, as a, uh, a, a set of people belonging to a certain cultures, we were or we are being very imaginative and very resilient in responding to the challenges. So let me just go through a couple of them. How did we respond to that? One was, and I think this was one of the great metaphor, at least I received from this lockdown experience. And this metaphor again and again comes back to my mind. And this metaphor was going back to home. Do you remember when the lockdown started, we all wanted to go back to home. In fact, I remember that. Here it started with the IAC students. The IAC Indian Institute of Science told students, you go all, all go, go to home, go to your homes. The migrant laborers, they decided themselves to go to their homes. People were doing field work. They also thought they should leave their field work and go back to their homes. Going back to home was a very powerful experience, almost all of us. And people who are living in their own homes, we go back to home, we be with our family, we be with our, our own familiar space. And for all of us, there was a going back to home. So for some of us, it was going from the office to the home. So we don't more go to the office, but we stay at the home. So going back to home was very, very powerful. And this, I think, is not something which we can disregard. Going to home is a very primeval 
phenomenon. Or throughout the descent of humankind, or you can say the descent of life itself, we have been always wanting to go home, go back to our homes. Of course, throughout our life, we design, redesign, and rediscover what is our home. But the idea of going back to home is a primeval force. <coughs> and why is this? Home has been the place where we can immediately relate to what could be said as health and receiving protection. So if you are at home, you are healthy and you are protected. And the home can be just your four walls where you have your own familiar spaces because over a period of time, you have cre created familiar spaces within that four walls or maybe more than four walls, wherever we are. So the familiarity of the space, which we call as the home, immediately gives us a sense of health and sense of protection. So we wanted either to go to people whom we are familiar with, our own family people, and then stay there and feel, oh, I am at home. So when a calamity comes, we want to be at home because home is a most primordial, primeval entity as far as our psychological or spiritual makeup is concerned. We always have been seeking home. And seeking home, of course, starts from seeking building a good, a good house to seeking a place where we feel settled. Philosophy and philosophy talk about home in a very, very interesting manner. In philosophical literature, home is the primal, is the final place for settlement, where you feel you are settled. So this going back to home was very, very interesting. And uh, this also told us there is a sense of regaining balance, which perhaps we have lost. So a self which is balanced was very inevitable for us, which uh, definitely was one of the key elements of our self-discovery in the lockdown experience. And once we are at home, we care for oneself, which is in, where, in our own ways, how we care for oneself. So caring for oneself is also very, very important. Most of the time we, we believe that caring for another person is more important than caring for oneself. No, in, in fact, unless you care for yourself, you will not be able to care for oneself. You're only transmitting your own challenges and difficulties and negativities to the other person. So to care, self-care is very, very important. And a self-cared person is able to care for the other. And uh, as a result of this, there was a shift in our narrative from negative to the positive. We started talking about uh, the number of death to discover recovery. So a narrative was shifted from death to recovery and disease to immunity. If you look at the information and the dialogues and discussion that were going on, you could, you could immediately see this these two different narratives which were, developed, which were developing of disease and immunity of death and recovery. And uh, I think as a loose bound culture of the mostly of Asian culture, I would think when compared to uh, China or Singapore, uh, ours is more a loosely bound culture where individuals are given freedom individuals are encouraged to think for themselves. And so this also gave us an impetus to look for various ways of coping and settlement, settling within ourselves and within the space which were allotted to us. Now, finally, I think as part of the lockdown experience, we also discovered another space, the discovery of a space for self-reliance. Of course, Prime Minister Modi ji talks about Atmanir Bharata, but I'm not talking about that political concept. 
or in any political sense. The self-reliance is of a renewed self-discovery. It is of a self-recovery which follows a self-discovery. You recover yourself, which has been perhaps bruised and hurt and challenged, and you discover a new self. For this process or this experience to happen, there has to be a connect with a transcendental space. So the analysis of the lockdown experience will not be complete unless we understand our urge and desire to connect to a transcendental space. So the last of this lecture of this series will be on that. And after this particular lecture, we will be looking at various dimensions of the self. And I don't have the time, so I have to uh, stop here, but I thought I should say one line each, at least about these different topics which are going to come. One is the distanced self, how we distance from ourselves and other people, and what were the implications for that, the psychiatric implications, psychological implications, which we will see tomorrow from Dr. Narendra. The alienated self, which I would uh, like to talk to you about uh, in another day, uh, the, the degree and sense of alienation. What is alienation? And uh, did we ever experience alienation before the, the COVID-19 or before this pandemic? Or was it a kind, new kind of alienation which we experienced? The mask self, the mask was another metaphor, right? I don't have to talk about it. At least I see in this, uh, uh, in this screen, at least two people I saw, Dr. Pushya wearing a mask some minutes back. Dr. Somashegar is wearing a mask. And many of us are wearing a mask. I have a mask in front of me. It's very uncomfortable for me. But the moment I get out of this, my room, I wear that. So we all have been using masks. And you look at the creativity which has happened in masks. People are making masks out of all kinds of materials now. So that has become a receptacle to show our creativity. Whether, whether all of these masks provide us health, we don't know. But definitely there's a lot of creativity and artwork going on in the realm of mask. But then the idea of mask, the concept of masking is deeply psychological and philosophical. It is just that we started wearing the mask in an outward manner in the last three months. Can we say that we, don't, we, were, we were not wearing masks before? Or we are not wearing masks now? So what exactly is the phenomenon of masking? The state enforced masking was different. The health institutions directive for us to wear masks is different. But the whole metaphor and the outward exteriorization of masking has also brought in the importance of the inner masking which we have been going through. And uh, there is also another dimension to this experience of ourself, which is breaking down all the meta narratives. It is the postmodern philosophy is all about breaking the meta narratives, Break, bringing them to individual stories. So we also would like to look at what is the postmodern self, which is also there in each one of us. And uh, another topic which I would be uh, having the pleasure of talking with you. This is about the narcissist self. People who are isolated, socially isolated, at times they are described as introvert or they are not able to connect with the society. And we also know about narcissistic phenomenon, which are very self-centered in a sense of very minuscule, puny little self which, are which is unable to connect with the larger exterior world outside, or even your own self, but a very minuscule, compartmentalized part of yourself. So the whole idea of being with oneself, the implications of narcissism, which was also very tremendously overpowering us during the lockdown is worth looking at. And apart from all this, there were three other selves which were very friendly to us. One was the poetic self, people who use their imagination in very many ways, not only really writing poetry, but doing paintings, 
talking to others in very loving manners. All this is a poetic self. What is to be having a poetic self is one of the topic which we'll see. And uh, another topic would be the sense of balancing. Balancing in terms of coping with extremities, opposites, binaries. And what is it to be balanced? Because we also talk about this concept in our daily life. Daily life. Even if we don't say that to ourselves, we very much like to say that to others, please be balanced, right? We talk to others and say, ask them to be balanced. It, it doesn't matter whether we are balanced or not. So the whole idea of balance and the last, as I said, the blissful self talk about our urge to connect with something which is transcendental and where we discover self-reliance and where we experience self-recovery. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I think we can take questions and I'm very sorry we have exceeded our time. I, my idea was to talk to you for about half an hour or 40 minutes, but I think I've taken well 35 minutes. And uh, we can raise questions. I can raise questions to you or you can raise questions to me and we can together raise questions. But I can guarantee you I will not have answers for all your questions. Uh, but in, in fact, I would like to share a few questions of mine with you because uh, we have to find the answers in each other's questions. So we can uh, listen to you. We would love to listen to you about your experiences, your questions, your thoughts, either after this lecture, what, what, how your mind has reacted to it, responded to it, or what were your thoughts as, as an experiencer of the lockdown experience, of the lockdown phenomenon. Ma'am, Supriya Bajpai has asked a question. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, can, can you he, Can he come onto the screen or does he have a face? Oh, Supriya. Supriya Bajpai. Yeah. yeah. You're muted. I think you, okay. I think I will have to mute you just one second. Yes, please. You have to unmute yourself, I think. I... I don't I don't know why we are not uh, hearing. You may have to unmute in your screen as well. Okay, can you read the... Uh, Ah, Supriya, yeah, you are here. Yeah. yeah, am I audible now? Yeah, now you are audible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, ma'am, basically, my question is like uh, many times, what it happens that uh, like when you were talking about the cells. So, what happens many times? It, it's not always about thinking in and uh, like uh, and thinking in such a way. Many times, uh, the self also acts as an observer. Uh, like when we are, as you have talked about the idea which appears through self. So, can we say that the self also acts as an observer rather than uh, like uh, rather than only the thinker. All right. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. Whether all the time we are we a thinker or mm -hmm. at times we are also an observer of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think if you're not speaking, you have to mute. Yes. Harika, would you like to read the questions then? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, Samika had a question. Experience is subjective. How the self chooses to experience experiences constitute the way it is experienced by self. Yeah. Okay. So, no, there's some other voice which is coming, which so, I don't know. Oh, yes. oh. uh, I don't know from where it is so, coming. So, avoid so, disturbance for others. Mm -hmm. I'm muting all. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
Well, Niharika, once again, please, what was the question? Yeah, ma'am, there are two questions. Uh, first is, experience is subjective. How the self chooses to experience, experiences constitute the way it is experienced by the self. All right, let's hear more, more questions and let me, as I said, let me not, uh, you know, be giving answers because I don't have the answers. Let us read other questions as well. Uh, the next question is, when we go into the transcendental space, that experience is very personal. Can it be philosophized? Philosophized, yeah. Who is that? Who asked that question? Is that person here? Yeah. Who yeah. is that person? So, oh. so can you unmute yourself while speaking? So we are not able to hear you. I have unmuted you, but I think you have un have to unmute yourself. Who is that, Niharika? Uh, Ma'am, it's oh, Mr. Yeah. Uh, so there's no here. Sir. Phone numbers. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. So yeah. We can yeah. This is Nuzhat here. So I, my question was, when you go into this transcendental uh, space, transcendental space, uh, it is a very personalized experience. So is there a possibility to philosophize it? Well, a quick response is, um, it is a very personal experience, but then the person is no more a small person. The person becomes more and more inclusive. And in the space of inclusion, there is nothing to be shared because everything is included. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, uh, is the experiencer and the experience a duality, like two sides of the same coin? Okay. Maybe we'll take more questions. Yeah. Uh, okay. We talked about the privileged class of people who have homes, whether that be we or the immigrants, but we have a class of people who don't have homes as a four wall space kind of a thing. How would we relate to the metaphor of home to this section of people? And furthermore, I feel the lockdown and lockdown are related to each other. There cannot be a clear cut distinction. Right. Uh, Saurab sir has written uh, something. He's okay. So, just a minute, ma'am. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Professor Sangeeta for your extreme stimulating thoughts. They have, in first place, brought us together in this. Uh, in this lockdown, logged down, in this lockdown, together at the plane, we have all the badly missed, I'm sure, na namely the psychological plane, the plane of isolation, helping us to overcome the server, serving sense of isolation during this time. The next question is, ma'am, dear ma'am, which has more impact on identity, lockdown or logged down? That's it? Yes, ma'am. For now, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I don't want to give answers to these questions because we will be finding and framing answers together. But I want to listen to more of you. If anyone of you would like to talk about any of the idea which we discussed or any of the idea which you think is important from your personal experiences, please share them. You may please unmute yourself and share some experience or yes amrita valli amrita valli would like to can i think you can unmute yourself hello ma'am good evening to everybody uh, i think this lecture was pretty it's given us a lot to process that's what i feel a lot, lot to think about and um, I just wanted to say, oh, yeah, so I'm here. I wanted to say that uh, a lot of the things I find uh, add little to what I, we have gone through, I have gone through. And one thing with respect to the polarization of space, what I felt more than my space splitting was my space merging. 
because my living space, my studying space, my reading space all became the same area. And I had to deal with maybe bifurc bifurcating it in my mind, taking the small room and creating different places for actions that I'm doing. Um, as for coping and uh, going back home and caring for oneself, yeah, that was, that was an interesting metaphor that you brought up. And um, yeah, that's, I, I also had, when you talked about um, initially in the beginning, about a self cannot exist without an experience. I just wanted to know uh, where would dreaming fit in that situation? Isn't, isn't when you dream an experience when you're not there, you're not really consciously there. And what about when people say in common parlance, oh, I forgot myself. Um, in a certain experience, it could be even in art when they're watching a performance or they're dancing themselves, things like that. So that was just, from my, from my educational point of view, I just, it was just a question. Thank you so much for the session. Anybody else? Hello? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Who is that? Okay. I'm Neha. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, I'm Neha Agarwal. Uh, thank you, Sangeeta, ma'am. That was a very nice session. Uh, your uh, perspectives have uh, validated and consolidated uh, everything uh, that we experienced. <coughs> Because uh, we're, we're still locked down, so we're still not able to uh, be relaxed in a way to reflect and put everything together. So the way you've put it is making sense and it's now coming all together. Uh, one strong experience that I felt, and I think some other people would also have felt uh, during the initial and peak time of the lockdown was the feeling of uh, oneness and compassion that how every, everyone is together and how everything is one. Because we saw how one person can infect anybody and anything can affect everything. So uh, how like, insects, climate, everything is affecting people. So the transcendental knowledge that we had not yet explored was coming, to, uh, coming in front of us through this grand experience of uh, the pandemic. So there was a brief time when there was a strong feeling of uh, that experience of oneness and that, you know, we, we cannot uh, isolate nature from human beings, that we cannot isolate animals from human beings and that we cannot even isolate hum one human being from another. We are all together. We have to survive together. But I think as the uh, intensity reduced this, intense feeling also kind of reduced. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's one thing that I wanted to share. And uh, I'm looking forward for more lectures. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's one question. Uh, Ma'am, you said that people in their coping have rediscovered their self. We have many selves, the materialistic self or the social self. Do you think we could have one self catering to all? All, the, all these selves? Yeah, so uh, a quick answer to that, uh, because it's a very tem uh, tempting question, is that when we conceive of social self, uh, psychological self, or whatever, different kinds of cells, we, are, we almost have an assumption that these selves have very strong, clear borders. But then, if you really deeply think, we know that these borders are very fragile. And the borders keep shifting and changing. And the border of one self becomes the border of another self. So in that sense, at any point, what we call as the self is also a mix of different kinds of inputs from different expressions of self. So it is not that the different selves exist in an isolated manner. There are some more questions, ma'am. Should I continue reading them? Uh, yeah, uh, or if anybody would like to speak. Yeah. 
Yes. Just raise your hand or. Uh, so much Shekhar sir wants to speak. Yes. Uh, 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 yes, madam. Good afternoon. And the metaphor which you gave and the going back home was quite uh, very powerful and uh, uh, very, very uh, kind of, what do I say? Yes, it's, it's quite powerful. It struck me. Uh, continuing from that, uh, I was wanting to ask this question and in fact I raised this uh, with many of my friends on a similar uh, kind of uh, conversations which I used to have. But none of us uh, came up with any convincing kind of answer. I, I would just like to read out that question or the kind of uh, thing. So why do we jump to pursue this uh, particular lockdown experience as a kind of unusual and difficult to bear with an experience and we are finding it difficult to accommodate it or endure it. While uh, we have heard or read about our previous generations going through the difficult experience due to war and plague and partition, famine and such hardships. Uh, these historical events uh, have recorded similar kind of exodus and uh, disturbances and uh, distress and all that. So despite uh, uh, having experienced, at least uh, through narratives and uh, cultural memories, uh, why, why are we finding it uh, difficult, especially the present generation? In uh, receiving this particular lockdown, as a different experience in uh, uh, our own learning. Uh, and why, 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 why are uh, people making so much noise about this? I'm just curious to understand. No, thanks. Anybody else would like to share their thoughts? I think we have started unlocking in a very slow manner, right? We need more time. We need more space to share. The sharing doesn't come very easily. We need to trust the other person. And uh, we need to trust the screen in front of us, right? In order to start sharing. Anybody else uh, would like to say something? Uh, uh, yes. Who is uh, that? That's my, that's my. Who is that? Uh, Somshikar again. Yeah. Uh, this is another point which you, you made, the masking of uh, ourselves. Uh, although it is uh, uh, being seen yeah. through this uh, physical mask in front of our nose and uh, mouth, uh, masking as a metaphor and a little kind of uh, understanding we have been uh, having and we have been experiencing. And in one of our earlier classes, I'm knowing an experience in the game, in that uh, uh, Roshaman movie uh, thing, uh, Akira Kurosawa uh, happened to say that uh, human beings are dishonest uh, about themselves and with themselves kind of thing. So that is the kind of basically, uh, are we so dishonest? Uh, and are, why, why are we so dishonest? And if so, why are we... Uh, Pretending, pretending to be uh, honest, kind of thing. Masking is definitely another uh, we, are, we, are, we are experiencing. So we will continue our conversations uh, in the days to come, unless somebody would like to speak at this point. And sh yes, Harsh, Harsh Tahal. You have to unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. It was a wonderful session. Learned a lot. And uh, for sir, he said something about masking. I think when ma'am said about masks, she meant how personality, because she was speaking from the personality perspective also, but how our personalities are also masked. 
and we have a persona which literally means a mask in greek so maybe that's how we were going to connect all our selves together so uh, that's what i'd like to add and uh, it's it's really nice ma'am thank you very much thank you anybody else all right then i think we will continue to meet in the coming days monday tuesday wednesday for a few weeks to come and uh, hope we will co discover many things about our own experiences and we will be able to share what we all perhaps already have shared thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you ma'am